जन दो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर जाने रे वैष्णव जन दो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान नाने रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर जाने रे सकल लोक मा सहुने वंदे निंदा ना करे के नीरे सकल लोक मा सहुने वंदे निंदा ना करे के नीरे वाच काच मन निश्चल राखे जननी ते नीरे वैष्णव जन तो तेरे कहिए जे पीड़ पर जाने रे समदृष्टि ने तृष्णा त्यागी पर स्त्री जे ने मात रे समदृष्टि ने तृष्णा त्यागी पर स्त्री जे ने मात रे जीव हाथ की असत्य न बोले पर धन न बझाले नहीं जेने दृढ़ वैराग जना मन मारे मोह माया व्यापे नहीं जेने दृढ़ वैराग जना मन मारे राम नाम शून ताली तिरथ तेना मन मारे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर जाने रे वन लोभी ने कपट रहित छे काम क्रोध निवार्या रे वन लोभी ने कपट रहित छे काम क्रोध निवार्या रे भाने नर संयुतनु दर्शन करता कुल एको Good morning everyone. 
And this morning, we'll be talking about two of the most important figures in the history of India and the religious history of the world, the Buddha and Shankara, because their birthdays always come within a week or two of each other. It goes by the Titi, so it's not exactly the same, but Shankaracharya's birthday falls on May 5th this year, and Buddha's birthday on May 16th. And th there's such an interesting connection between these two figures, even though they're separated by so many centuries, a connection with regard to social things, philosophical things, religious things. They were so different in so many ways and so similar in so many ways. And there's this tension between the two of them. Shankaracharya is uh, credited, not always accurately, with uh, the downfall of uh, Buddhism in, in India. Uh, and yet, uh, they had so many things in common. So uh, to me, it's always interesting that their birthdays fall close together and nice to uh, think about them side by side and the importance that they both had in the lives of uh, some of the great souls that came after them. And it, uh, we'll also see uh, what Sri Ramakrishna had to say about both Shankaracharya and, and, uh, and Buddha. And also Swamiji, we know that uh, Swamiji had tremendous love for Buddha. He thought he was one of the greatest men who ever lived, his compassion and everything. And Shankaracharya, he thought that he had the greatest intellect. And uh, so we have so many nice connections. I thought that I would take this opportunity, say a little bit about the lives of both of them and uh, the connection between them and the importance of, of their teachings. Shankaracharya, of course, was the upholder of orthodoxy. He and Swamiji criticized him a little bit for that, but uh, the orthodox tradition, he had to at his time. Everything we have to see in the context of time, when, when he was born, uh, there was a great need to bring some order back into the Hindu tradition. Uh, Buddha, on the other hand, he was the iconoclast. He was the one who broke down everything. That, and that was necessary at that time because of the excess of priestcraft and, and uh, privilege and other things. So they each had their special role to play. Shankaracharya, he raised the status of, of the scriptures himself. It's hard to imagine how important he was. Even the Upanishads in Gita. Gita apparently was not such a popular text before Shankaracharya's time. It's not referred to that much. Uh, his commentary was so important that some people even think at one time they thought that Shankaracharya himself was the author of Gita. But after his time, everybody had to write a commentary. His was the earliest that we have. There were others that are referred to. But this is the importance that Shankaracharya represented for the tradition with his commentaries and how he reestablished uh, the whole temple system in India and uh, puja and worship and everything, even though we think of him just as a pure jnani. So he was a very well-rounded figure. So. And we'll find that there's a tremendous contrast that this great philosopher and Buddha was the anti-philosopher. He, he did his very best to steer away from the, any metaphysical questions and speculative questions. He was extremely practical in his outlook towards uh, to spiritual life. So each had a very important role to play in the history of India. Each had an important role to play uh, in Vedanta as we know it. Uh, each influenced uh, Swamiji very much, and Sri Ramakrishna also, as I say, I had very interesting things to say about both of them. Swamiji really thought that the ultimate and perfect ideal human being would be a combination of Shankaracharya and Buddha. There's a very nice quote that he says, what is now wanted is the combination of the greatest heart with the highest intellectuality of infinite love with infinite knowledge. Existence without knowledge and love cannot be. Knowledge without love and love without knowledge cannot be. 
What we want is the harmony of existence, knowledge, and bliss infinite, for that is our goal. We want harmony, not one-sided development, and it is possible to have the intellect of a Shankara with the heart of a Buddha. I hope we shall all struggle to attain that blessed combination. So we'll see that uh, two were so distinct they had their different uh, areas that they worked in, uh, but one thing that they had in common was this one-pointed desire to reach the highest goal of life. They may have understood it a little bit differently, they may have expressed it a little differently, and this tremendous renunciation. We'll see this in the lives of, of both of them, this desire to just cast off this maya and go straight for the truth. So they had uh, many more things in common, I would say, than they had differences. I want to start out a little bit, uh, say a little bit about the life of the Buddha. We know so many things, and we've heard these stories over and over again. I sometimes wonder, what's the point of repeating stories over and over again? And yet, we have different traditions. Uh, I grew up in a Jewish tradition, and uh, every week there'll be the same story that's told a year ago from that same, because it goes every year you finish reading the, the Torah, and uh, so you have the same thing. So we know we're going to hear the same story. We're going to hear about uh, getting the Ten Commandments. We're going to hear about crossing the, the Red Sea, whatever it is. Uh, and kind of look forward to it. And, and the repetition of it is somehow helpful to us. So anyhow, uh, we know the story, but it's uh, such a beautiful story with the life of, of Buddha, how uh, he led a princely life. He, he, we hear about his father being a king. Those days there were small kingdoms. It wasn't a large thing, but still a very uh, opulent kingdom. And uh, he grew up with uh, uh, no wants or cares or anything like that. He's supposed to have been born in the year 563 BC, the full moon day of Vaishak. We know it is a Buddha Purnima. Now, he was given the name Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha, very appropriate name, one who has realized the goal of life. And when they cast his horoscope, they saw that there were two possibilities for him. Either he'll be a, a great ruler, a great king, and uh, with great power and, and efficiency and organizational skills. Uh, and at the same time, they found that uh, he could go in the other direction and become a, a wandering holy man. So even in those days, there were sannyasins in the, the time of, of Buddha. So his parents uh, thought that uh, we want him to remain. We don't want him to leave home. We want him to uh, eventually take over the kingdom and everything. So they made a vow that they would not let him experience any of the dark side of life, anything that might make him develop this uh, spirit of renunciation. So he led the most protected type of life we can imagine, where he hardly ever left the compound, the palace compound, with the beautiful gardens and everything like that. And he was given in marriage to a, a beautiful young girl who was a distant cousin of his, uh, Yashodhara, at the age of 16. So they had their own palace built for them. There was constant singing and dancing and music and feasting and parties and everything. Perfect life, huh? but it's not such a perfect life because the little doubt comes, is this, is this all there is to life? So this, of course, Buddha, he was, he was destined for something else. So a little doubt came into his mind that is this everything? What's the rest of the world like? So the charioteer was, uh, uh, we can say, it, like a close friend, an elder friend of his. So he said, without telling anybody, you take me outside one time. I want to see what the rest of the world looks like. So they, they went out for the first time, and he saw an old man. He had never seen this before. His teeth had all dropped out. His hair was white. He was all bent over. And he could hardly walk. And the Buddha said, that, who is this old man, all bent over like that? 
And uh, he said, the charioteer said that, sir, he's, this is, he is an old man. He's weak and he's helpless. He's been abandoned by his family as birds leave a withered tree. So Buddha said, really? This happens? This, is this an unusual thing? Said, no. Does it happen to everyone? It happens to everyone. It'll happen to me. It'll happen to you. It'll happen to my wife. It'll happen to your wife. So he was shocked. It was hard to imagine such a naive young man at the age of 16. He was shocked. He said, take me back to the palace. So he went back and gradually got back his, his uh, former self. And after another week or so, said, let's go for another trip. So his charioteer took him out. And this time they saw a sick man lying by the side of the road, groaning in pain. And he said, who is this man? And he said, he is a sick man. There's no hope for him, that we don't know what will happen to him. He has a very bad disease. And so the Buddha is a disease. He had never seen anybody sick. And he said, does it happen to everybody? Sooner or later, he said, you'll get something. He said, everyone, everyone. So again, he was very upset, a little bit angry, a little frustrated. Why didn't people tell me all of these things? And uh, I thought life would be so easy and smooth. I had no idea. So he said, take me back. So after another week or so, he said, let's go again for another trip outside. Then they saw a long procession, and they saw these four men holding a cot and something covered in cloth and people weeping and wailing. And he said, what happened? What's going on? And he said that uh, someone in the family has died, and they're going to the funeral pyre, that uh, they'll burn up the body. And uh, then he, he thought, I had never considered this that uh, people uh, at some point will die. And he said, it happens to everyone, right? And he said, of course, it happens to everyone. Even my beautiful young wife, yes. My parents, yes. Even myself, yes. So again, he said, take me back. And now the mind was ripe. It was ripe for uh, that uh, tremendous renunciation was starting to come to him. So he said, take me for a, a fourth trip. And they went out again. And he sees a young man wearing this ochre cloth and his face beaming with joy, not looking from one side to the other, just walking straight ahead. And he said, who is this young man? And he said that this is a wandering monk. He's renounced everything. He's gone in search for truth. He doesn't have any attachments to the world. He doesn't have any possessions. But he's, he's perfectly content with, with whatever little he gets. So the Buddha said, this is a wonderful thing. That, uh, I would like to be a person like that. So now this idea came into his mind. First he had to get that renunciation, and then he had to see that living example of someone who would have renounced everything. So he went back. He conspired with his, the charioteer. What was his name? Anyone remember? Ch huh? Was it Chandra? Chandra? I don't Anyhow, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. So he conspired with him. And he said, on such and such a night, we'll go out together. And uh, uh, you'll untie the horse, and I'll take off that, and I won't come back. So he did that, and uh, he saw a beggar, wandering beggar, and, and he exchanged clothes with him. And he, he gave away his horse, and he, he went on foot. And then he spent... Uh, uh, following years in search of truth. What is that realization that will remove all this misery, help us transcend uh, this the life that's, that's filled with uh, frustration and uh, is not fulfilling? And uh, he said, there has to be something. So then we know that uh, he had his different groups that he met with. He stayed with, practiced extreme austerities, uh, was disappointed with, with one group and another group. Then finally, he was uh, half starved to death. And that one night, uh, as he was almost starving, that one young woman, Sujata, Sujata gave him a little bit of payas, a little rice pudding. And uh, the other monks, they were disgusted for a monk to accept 
such a nice thing from a young girl and everything. The, this isn't the person. They all left him. And then he said that night he took that vow. Ihasane sushitume shariram tvagasti mansam pralaryam chayatu aprapya bodhim bahu kalpa dolabham naivasanat kaimadas chalishite. He said, I'm going to sit on this seat and I don't care. I'll sit here as long as it takes. This body can completely wither away that my bones and, and the muscle, skin, flesh, everything, that can all go to rot unless I get that enlightenment. I won't move from the seat. And then we know the whole night he was attacked by uh, these d demons in the form of, of different desires and temptations and everything. And when he woke up, when, he, when the morning came, he was up the whole night in meditation, he had gotten that enlightenment. And the rest of his life he spent uh, in disseminating the truth. He went back home after that and uh, see he didn't completely abandon the family. He went back and, and brought them all into the fold of the, the Buddhist tradition and everything and they all played an important role to play. He had a son also, that's another important thing. When, the, when he had left, it was just after his son was born. And he looked at the son and said that this son will be an obstacle for me, Rahu. He named him Rahu. And uh, so he left the son behind. When he came back, the son also became a part of this, the uh, future Buddhist Sangha, the community that they had. So then we have his sermons. He went from place to place and, and developed the whole community. At one time, uh, Swamiji says, and, and, and we know, almost the entire country of India uh, became, we can say, Buddhist. It wasn't exactly a, a separate religion at the time. The only reason why it's considered uh, outside the, uh, the confines of the Hindu tradition is that he didn't recognize the ultimate authority of the Vedas. That's the only reason. Otherwise, Hinduism was such a huge umbrella. All of his teachings and everything could easily fit within the Hindu tradition and ultimately were kind of brought back into it. But that was considered the heterodox, heterodox schools were the ones that didn't give the final authority and accept the uh, revealed nature, the Shruti idea of the scriptures. And uh, he, as I say, he was a bit of an iconoclast that, uh, and highly egalitarian. That meant that no distinction who was allowed to, to study scriptures who was allowed to take sannyasa, who was allowed to take sacred thread. Uh, he was completely against all of these privileged things, which is why Swamiji loved him so much, one of the reasons, of course. And uh, all of the teachings were done in, in the local language of the time, Pali or some type of Pali, uh, not in Sanskrit, which was also uh, an unusual thing. Uh, so this is, this is essentially the life of the Buddha and the, such tremendous spiritual power that uh, uh, large numbers of the country not only followed him, but took to uh, sannyasa. So the country was filled with monasteries, you know, both men and women. He started the women's order also. This was the first really organized monastic system in all of India. And uh, uh, on some level, uh, the, the first kind of template that was used for the Ramakrishna order because before that, uh, it was mostly wandering monks, not all staying together in, in monasteries and things like that. That was more of a Christian tradition, actually, these big monastic institutions. Now, the life of Shankaracharya. This is also a fascinating life. He was born in a small town, Kaladi, in, in Kerala. I went there a number of years ago and uh, you can see it just uh, right by the little river where they lived and everything. This, uh, this is not, I was thinking Shankaracharya, there'll be a huge temple, thousands of people will come every day, but it's not like that. They prefer to go to the big temples from Eshwaram and other things like that. Uh, but uh, I was very inspired to, to go and uh, see the place where he actually lived, and uh, although just for a short period of time. So his story is that uh, uh, 
His parents had no children for a long time, and when he was born, uh, he was, uh, of course, uh, highly beloved. When a child is a male child, especially, is born late in life, it's considered a very great thing. Uh, and uh, his father died when he was very young. So as far as I can remember, he was an only child. I don't think there was any other brother to do any, uh, any type of uh, shraddha, anything for the family like that. Uh, from a young age, he was born a very high Brahmin family. He was uh, uh, given a wonderful education in Sanskrit and scriptures and everything, but had a tremendous desire to renounce the world. One possible reason is, of course, the death of a parent, death of a father. We see, even in the case of Swamiji, who uh, didn't really need any extra boost for his renunciation, but when his father passed away, that was a turning point, even in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, that uh, we see very often the father dies young. Part of the reason is that there was very often a big age gap, huh? that the, the husband was much older than the wife, so naturally, uh, he'll be older when children are born and he'll die or, earlier. So, but it happened very often. In any event, whatever the reason was, uh, he had this tremendous longing to renounce the world. But he had his poor mother, his widow's mother there, and uh, he wouldn't do it without getting permission from his mother. So there's a story. We don't know. These things are not so historical. But anyhow, as the story goes, he was going for his bath one day, and he was caught by a crocodile. And his mother was there, and he yelled to his mother that I'm caught by a crocodile, it looks like I, I'm dying. So grant me permission, there's something called apad sannyasa, that uh, when there's a, uh, one is in danger of, of losing his life, at least let him die as a sannyasin, and just he can do it on his own. So the mother thought, yes, if my child is going to die, let him die as a sannyasin, that'll be great merit for him, or, or liberation, whatever. So she gave permission. And then, of course, the crocodile or alligator, whatever it was, let go of him. And it was all part of that leela. Uh, and then what to do? He had already done it. He had already taken the, the vows, and the mother understood that. So he said, but don't worry, I'll come back. I'll be with you uh, at the final, your, your final days at the end. And it's very interesting that the relationship that these great souls had with the mother especially, we see with the Chaitanya Deva also that he was the only remaining son at that time. That all the other children had died young and his older brother was, uh, had also taken sannyasa and left. So it was a great tragedy for, for his mother when he renounced, but he said, I'll always be available to you, that I'll stay in Puri, it's not that far, you'll get news from me and everything. And Swamiji, how he took care of his mother, even as a monk. And Sri Ramakrishna, huh? he had his mother live with him uh, in the, in the, in the Hobart, and he was there. He was with her the very final moment, how he uh, had her, her body carried to the banks of the Ganga, and he was, was right there by her side when she passed away. He even wanted to do some this offering of a tarpan. You know, this is something that the son will do for the mother. But the water went through his fingers. And this was something that was very typical in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, that things manifested in a very tangible way with him. The, according to the scriptures, the sannyasin is not allowed to do these Vedic rituals and things. So automatically, uh, the, the water slipped out. Galida Hasta, it's called. And he wasn't able to do that. But uh, Shankaracharya, who we think of as so the dry jnani, he had that tremendous love for his mother. And he actually did. He actually came back and uh, did all the preparations and everything. And was criticized by the Orthodox sannyasins for that. That you're supposed to, who is mother, who is father to a sannyasin? Says, Why do you have this attachment in doing these Vedic things that you're not supposed to do? Anyhow, when he, when he left home and started wandering, then he met Govindapada, who became his guru. Govindapada was a disciple of Gaurapada, who wrote the famous Mandukya Karika. And uh, uh, he instructed him, you write commentaries. You, you wander, go to the holy places, and you write commentaries on the Upanishads and, and Gita and other things. So this is how he, he spent his time. 
And again, how he did it, he, uh, in the short life, he died young, in the short life, how he wrote so many things, not just uh, commentaries on all the Upanishad, the Gita, Brahma Sutra, and wrote all of the different booklets, treatises and things, Viveka Churamini and other things, and so many hymns. And at the same time, somehow reestablished this whole temple tradition in India and debated all of the other schools uh, and defeated them and uh, in that one short lifetime. I don't know <laughs> how it's possible that he did uh, all of these things. He established <coughs> the whole monastic system according to the Dashanami tradition. In the four, uh, four of the holy spots of, of India, we have our four mat, the, the four main monasteries, in Sringeri Puri, Joshi Mat, and Dwaraka. And each one has its own Mahavakya, and each one has its uh, own, had its own uh, head of the, of the uh, ashram at that time. So he, he did so many other things to reestablish the, because it was, it was a period of, of transition the end of the Buddhist period, uh, the uh, Mughal invasion would take place uh, soon after that, and uh, it was a, a, a period where some stability was necessary. This is why I think that uh, he was very orthodox about certain things. Then he reestablished the preeminence of Vedanta. At that time, there were all these debates that would take place between the different schools and, and the great figures of uh, uh, Sankhya and, and the, uh, the uh, Brahmana portion, the Mamsakas and everything, that they would have these big debates. And if you lost the debate, you had to become a, a follower of, of the person that you lost to. That was, that was the tradition. So there's one very uh, well-known event that took place. There was one, Kumali Labhatta. He was, was really... According to many historians, he was really the one who defeated the Buddhists mostly. We always hear that Shankaracharya, because of him, that was the end of the Buddhist tradition, but it wasn't simply him. He, uh, uh, this Kumari Labhata was a very important figure. And uh, he, so Shankaracharya wanted to, uh, to meet him and debate him. But he couldn't do it. The, he, was <laughs> he was doing penance slowly burning himself to death in a funer funeral pyre uh, to expiate the sin. What was the sin? He had pretended to be a Buddhist and took an initiation, initiation with a Buddhist guru in order to learn their doctrines in order to defeat them. So anyhow, this is the story. So they say that he said, no, then you go debate and my disciple, Mandana Mishra. So we know this long story with how they had a debate and how, how would they decide uh, who won the debate? Huh? So there was a whole thing that uh, his wife, Ubhaya Bharati, was there, and uh, there's something about putting the flowers on, and the one who won, uh, the, the, who lost the flowers, would, would wither up and everything. So a lot of stories about this, how uh, Shankaracharya was winning everything, and then uh, they said, no, now we have to do some things for, about householders. Shankaracharya said, I don't know anything about that. I've been a monk from boyhood. So he said, give me a little time, and then he entered into the king of the body of a king who was dying and had the experience of the king life and came back. And there are a lot of these different uh, incidents. They're all described in, the, in some of the biographies that we have. And uh, so he defeated this Mandana Mishra who became Sureshwaracharya, one of his chief disciples, and was sent to Sringeri, and he started the Mutt there. So in the midst of, of all of this, he remembered his pledge to his mother, and he visited her on her deathbed. He himself built the funeral pyre and performed the final rites. So again, uh, the, this is something even Sri Ramakrishna couldn't do, but he did it to the objection of, of the Orthodox community. And then retired to the Himalayas and uh, supposedly passed away at the age of 32. So he did all of this in such a short time. If you go to Kedarnat, You'll see there's, there's a, next to the temple on the left side, there's a, uh, a hut, there's a samadhi. Hut. It's supposed to be where he had his maha samadhi, where he passed away and, and uh, uh, where he was buried or his ashes are buried. I'm not, not sure what happened there. 
Okay. So we see that uh, philosophically, there were a lot of differences. That in Buddhist tradition, somehow, whether rightly or wrongly, uh, became one of denial, especially the, the southern schools that no God, no self, no permanence, nothing like that. Northern schools are a little bit different, but uh, how different that was from Shankaracharya and this idea of shunyata, there's everything empty and void, and the whole Vedantic tradition is purna, purna, everything is full and perfect and infinite. Uh, how different. But at the same time, we see that they had so many other things in common. This, this sincere, uh, earnest, tremendous longing for truth, to have the direct experience, this, this passion for the world, and not caring at all about enjoyment or pleasures or anything like that. And discrimination between the real and the unreal. What's ultimately important in life? What's, what's of the highest value? The shreyas and prayas. So that way they were, they were so similar in their outlook. Both have been branded as pessimistic. Buddhists, of course, Nastika. We hear that all of the time, because denying this, denying that. And for Shankaracharya, that he was a Mayavadin, that was the, the criticism of him. Oh, he says everything is, is illusory. The whole world is illusory, and uh, we shouldn't have to worry about it, anything like that. So that was a big criticism. And funny thing is that uh, those who wanted to criticize Shankaracharya would call him uh, a crypto or hidden Buddhist. That was the, the criticism of him even though the, they were so opposite in their philosophy, but because they both looked upon this world as something to be shunned a little bit. So they said that, uh, don't be fooled. He's pretending to be a Vedantist. He's really a Buddhist in disguise. This was, uh, for his enemies would, would criticize him that way. But most, mostly, really, they were just realistic. They understood the transitory nature of this world, they understood that there's suffering in this world, and they knew that uh, there's a way out of it, that we're not destined to just lead lives that will end in frustration and, and uh, uh, will use up all of our energies and things that won't last, that they, they came with that message. No, there's something positive. There's something to be gained out of this life. So the real purpose, I feel, for both of them was to instill this longing for truth, for realization, this longing to uh, uh, attain something higher, something greater in life, and uh, that there is an ultimate goal. And with Buddha, of course, this was his reason for saying, don't get bogged down in philosophy and everything, that uh, just go straight towards the goal. There's these different theories, they're so intricate and everything that you'll just get lost in this forest the forest of, of uh, logical uh, ideas and, and theories and, and doctrines and things. The work that is most well known in the Buddhist tradition is the Dhammapada, and a very beautiful text. It's uh, just uh, a series of, of different statements made by the Buddha, collected statements and mostly about this, uh, how this world is, is something to be transcended, that we have to realize that there's something deeper to get out of life. So it's full of, of renunciation, full of discrimination, and uh, a lot of it has to do with teachings that we get from Sri Ramakrishna himself, that how much of this world is a question of our mind, that how we see this world, that it's not, there's no objective reality that everyone sees the same thing, that as we think, so we see this world. And uh, so everything goes back to ourselves, the way we understand things. So this Dhammapada, 423 verses on the way to truth. And uh, the main teaching of Buddha was what we call the Four Noble Truths. And the first one, is that suffering exists. This is why he was considered to be a little bit pessimistic. Everything is dukkha, so dukkha mai. Everything that suffering exists, but he, as I say, this was just really uh, telling us to face the facts 
that there's no getting around the fact that we'll all get old, we'll all get weak, our memories will start to fade, uh, we'll have some illness, that uh, we'll have great expectations, some will be fulfilled, some won't, that this is, this is life, this is just the way it is, that we have to be honest and look at things that way, and that all of these things are painful. Birth is painful, old age is painful, being a teenager is painful. Huh? All of these things, getting married sometimes, <laughs> not always of course, but uh, all of these things are painful. So this was the first, the first truth that uh, we have to recognize what this world is really like. If we, if we just take it as face value, value and don't look for anything else, this is what we have in store for us. Then, second truth, that suffering has an origin. It's not just uh, that this is the plan of the world, but if we analyze, it all goes back to what? Desire. Trishna, tanha. That we have a thirst for things. This longing for things is what is that noose that drags us from one thing to another. Because we're never satisfied with things. That we get one thing, we want another thing. So things that distract us. That what we have to do is our spiritual practice. We have to look very clearly at life and see what's important, what's not important, and how to realize something higher in life. So his real main message was lead a life long where we aspire for the truth, where we try to realize that something is uh, a deeper type of truth and that there's a way to live life that's more fulfilling than this ordinary life of just uh, always running after things, sometimes getting them, sometimes not getting them, and uh, getting them and realizing it's not what we really wanted. Uh, that there's something better and deeper in life, and it comes from leading a life of simplicity, a life of self-control, moderation, that middle path, and a life of meditation, which will lead us to nirvana. So this is that uh, teachings we find at Dhammapada. When we get to Shankaracharya, we have, I think his, uh, for me, the one that I like best, I won't say most important, but my favorite work of Shankaracharya is Bhajavinda. This is, uh, is such a beautiful hymn that he wrote. Bhajavinda gives the impression when we hear the title that this will be devotional. Uh, worship Govinda. The worship now, why would Shankaracharya be telling us that when everything is the self and Maya and all of that? When we read the, the hymn, there's nothing about worshiping Govinda in it. This is just. It comes with the story and comes with the title and everything, but it's all about renunciation. Very strong, stern renunciation. When I was uh, doing my uh, graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, I had a little, you know, those little uh, cassette tape recorders. Uh, I had that and, and I had the songs of Ram Prasad one other thing, it was called the Ramakrishnayana. It was a very nice little thing. I don't know if anybody of you uh, ever heard that. It's like a jatra about Ramakrishna's life. And Bhaji Govindu. They were the three things that I had. The Subalakshmi. Huh? And I used to listen to that Bhaji Govindu over and over and over again. Uh, she, uh, well, the way she sang it and, and everything was just ex exquisite. So I developed a great love for this, this Bhaji Govindu. And I... Uh, it's not a philosophical work in the sense that it talks about all these different doctrines and everything. It's all about how we develop uh, this, this spirit of, of renunciation, this passion for the world, this longing for something higher. So I thought I would just share just a couple of verses from this Bhajavindu. First, this, the story. M many of Shankaracharya's uh, hymns and other things, they have a story connected with them. And this one says that he was walking along uh, one, one of the bathing ghats at, uh, in Benares. These are places where people, of course, they spend their time in meditation and uh, contemplating uh, if it's Manikarnika, God, contemplating death and other things like that. He's a very old man was there, 
and he was trying to memorize the, the rules of grammar, panini, rules of uh, grammar. And he thought, this old man at that time, that stage of his life, what will he gain by, by learning <laughs> how to memorize all of these? There are all these different rules that you have, and people will memorize them uh, so that they can teach somebody else to, the Vyakarana, grammar. Uh, that's the, what, will it, what good will it do for him? So he took pity on him. And the story is that he composed this hymn. The, the verse that's repeated each time is Bhajya Govindam, Bhajya Govindam, Bhajya Govindam, Murhamate, Samprapte, Sannahite Kale, Nahi Nahi Rakshadi, Dukrankarane. Dukrankarane is, is one of these panani, uh, kind of code things, like little sutra things. There's some grammatical rule. So he told this old man, worship Govinda. Worship Govinda, worship Govinda. That means do some spiritual practice. Not that he's saying specifically it has to be Govinda, but devote your life. This is the very end of your life. You devote your, yourself to something higher. Do, uh, worship Govinda, O fool, Mudhamat. Rules of grammar will not save you at the time of death. And then there's so many other beautiful verses uh, o oh fool, give up your thirst to amass wealth. Devote your mind to thoughts to the real. Be content with what comes through actions already performed in the past. And then, yeah, some really, I like this. Dina yaminyo sayam parata. Shishi ravasanta punarayat. Kala karida te gachatiyayus. Tadapina munchatiyashavayus. Daylight and darkness, dusk and dawn. Winter and springtime come and go. Then we have this line Kala kridati. Time is playing. Gachati ayuhu. And our life is flying. There's just a play of time. Day after day, things are going. And then we turn around one day, and, and what happened? We're old men, old women. How did it happen? The play of time. So it's just, time is, is just running around and playing. Tadapi, even then, namunjati asha vayu, then you won't give up these winds of hope. Always thinking, all oh, things will be better. I, I, I won't be like everybody else, suffering at the end. I won't have old age and death. And everything. We see, every day we see time is playing this game. It comes and it goes, it comes and it goes, and one after another after another. And next thing you know, how did it happen? We say, I just was playing with my friends the other day. Huh? And now I look at myself. I can hardly stand up without some pain in the back and this and that. Huh? The play of time. So then after each verse, he says, Worship the Lord, that uh, nothing will be of any avail to you at the time of death. These, these rules of grammar and things like that. It's very interesting to see what Sri Ramakrishna had to say about both Shankaracharya and Buddha. See, Sri Ramakrishna, he had, I mean, aside from the fact that, oh, of course, we feel he was an avatar, aside from that fact, he had such a sharp intellect and could cut through everything and just could really get to the essence and things, how we could really deeply understand all of these things, that uh, he could easily see how the, these two different figures and, and their ways of explaining the world and everything, how easily they could be reconciled. So there's no ultimate contradiction. And even the teachings of Shankaracharya and Sri Ramakrishna are very often look different, how they can also be reconciled. So he was really the preacher of harmony, the Samanvaya. He really uh, had that ability to get to the essence and show how when we go a little deeper that these differences uh, become unimportant. The verse that's always attributed to Shankaracharya is a shloka dhena parakshami. I'll tell you in half a verse. Yaduktam karanta kotibi, which is written in all of the scriptures, thousands and thousands of scriptures. Brahma satyam, the Brahman alone is real. Jagad mithya. And this world is unreal. Jiva Brahma na apraha. Jiva Brahma eva na apraha. That uh, Jiva and Brahman are one and the same. This is what you call the Jiva is really Brahman and nothing else at all. Swamiji said in one place that uh, I worship that God whom people ignorantly call man. Uh, 
So the jiva is nothing but Brahman. So this was his teaching. Everything is fine, but this this the mitya, the, the jagat mitya. This is the, the thing that uh, uh, takes a little understanding. And what does mitya mean? False. Sri Ramakrishna always says it really means impermanent. It doesn't mean that it's a dream, but it can be taken that way. Thakur tells the different stories about the farmer who had the dream that this is, uh, several children were there and he woke up and they were gone and he found his son was dead. And, which do I, do I grieve for the children that are no longer there that I dreamt about or the other one who's, who's died? So he, he says, yes, according to the jnani, this world is unreal like a dream. We don't have to say literally like a dream, but it has that same impermanence to it. So uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he, he could uh, take this idea that this world is something false, something to be shunned, and explain it as a very important idea, but not a final truth. This is the way he explained it. This neti neti, don't take this as a final position, that this is what we, how we, distinguish between the permanent and the impermanent. So the universe is constantly changing. It's uh, nothing to cling to, nothing of, of ultimate value. We want to have something deeper. So we, we do that to climb up to the steps. Then when we get to the roof and come back down, then we see that everything is manifest. Sarvam Kalavidam Brahma. This, this is the, the sticking point. How do we say the world is a dream? And at the same time, we say that all of this is Brahman itself. So for Sri Ramakrishna, both are true. One is on the way up, the other is on the way down. So on the way up, uh, we, we try to uh, see that because we have to get rid of attachment. That's the main thing. This is all changeful and everything. So uh, he explained it that way. Somebody asked him, then, is the world unreal? And he said, as long as you haven't realized God, the world is unreal. After that, we see the world is real because there's nothing but Brahman itself. The Divine Mother herself manifested as the world. So Thakur could easily get around these things. When uh, the conversations were being held uh, among the, the disciples when he was in Kashipur Garden House. Because Narendra and some others, I think uh, uh, Tarak, Mahapush Maharaj, and Kali, Swami Bhairananda, I think just the three of them. Anyhow, they went to Bodh Gaya. So uh, Thakur, uh, when they came back, Thakur asked him so many questions uh, because he didn't know much about the Buddhist tradition because there wasn't much of a Buddhist, almost no Buddhist tradition in India at that time. I always found it interesting that he practiced so many religions, but not, there was never a Buddhist teacher that came to him because it was really, it had disappeared at that time. But he knew, he knew enough. He knew enough to ask good questions and everything. And then, uh, he gave the perfect answer to this, uh, this question uh, about uh, what the ultimate nature of reality. And he said, the ultimate nature of reality is between asti and nasti. If you say, yes, it's pure existence, then it's something beyond even that. You say it's non-existence beyond even that. And this is really... Uh, probably the position of Buddha himself. This is why he didn't want to say anything about it. And for Shankaracharya, they always say Advaita. They don't say uh, that it's monism, but non-dualism. It goes beyond. And the dualism even of existence, non-existence. Existence, non-existence. It goes beyond even that. So we see how uh, Sri Ramakrishna was able to uh, go beyond these differences. So this ultimate reality, what is the nature of Brahman? Is it Purna or is it Shunya? Huh? Just, this is just our point of view. Shunya is also true. This is perfectly empty. This is Brahman. There's nothing within it. It's perfectly pure and empty. But it's not a non-existent thing. So it's, it's, it's infinite, pure, perfect. It's Purna. But it's devoid of anything changeful. So it's Shunya. So both are true. And it's beyond both of them. So this is how Sri Ramakrishna could, could easily explain all of these things. But ultimately for, for Buddha and that whole tradition, it was a practical question. One of the parables that I think is most helpful for us is uh, the man who was shot with an arrow. 
It was a poisonous arrow. He was shot by that. He was quickly dying. And uh, Bhutta said, suppose this man who was dying, uh, they want to find a doctor for him. And he says, no, before you find the doctor, I want to know who shot the arrow. I want to know what the tribe he was from. I want to know how old he was. I want to know what he did. All, all these different questions. And it, won't he die before he gets all of these answers? So what is the intelligent thing to do? Go get the doctor, get the physician. So Buddha, he was like the physician and remove the arrow. So this was exactly what Sri Ramakrishna says. And when you go to the mango grove, why do you go there? Do you care how many mangoes are on the tree and how many branches and twigs and everything? We go to eat the mangoes. He says, go and eat the mangoes. So, so we see how Sri Ramakrishna, how uh, he could reconcile all of these things. He understood the importance of Shankaracharya's, uh, even, even his idea that this world is, is something fleeting something transitory. He understood the purpose of that to bring non-attachment. And, and these Bhajavindas, uh, some of the things and in, in, uh, verses there talk about uh, how this body that is so beloved, as soon as the body dies, no one will touch it and everything. He tells the same types of stories and everything, just to bring this type of dispassion, this, to sh shock us into understanding that uh, there's something more important in life. So uh, I thought it would be nice today that uh, as we're approaching the birthdays of Shankaracharya and uh, the Buddha, that we would uh, be able to spend a little time thinking about uh, their two lives, the importance of their lives in, in the uh, tradition of India, the, the tradition of uh, religions of the world, and uh, how important a role they played in the life of Swamiji also, and Sri Ramakrishna as well. So let's sit quietly for a few minutes, and then after that, we'll have a closing song from Kusunji. <laughs> 